Now, did you know your brain never turns off or rests? Even when you're asleep, it's active, especially when you're dreaming. Ouch. Today, we're looking at your sensory neurons. Oh, Chris! Yes, Sand? I've got someone for you to meet. I don't want to meet anyone, Sand. I'm preparing for an experiment. Yes, but you are really going to want to meet this person. Why? Because he's a lot like you. A lot like me? Well, in that case... Ah! Sand, this is not in any way like me. I mean, I don't have that enormous tongue, or these huge hands, or those ridiculous feet. Chris, meet your homunculus. Or, as I like to call him, Homuncia Chris. That is quite a good name. This is a homunculus. It's my body, but it highlights the places where I have the most sensory neurons by making those areas humongous. All over your body, you have sensory neurons, which enable you to feel things. They give you your sense of touch, but there are more of them in some parts of your body than in others. And this homunculus, Homuncia Chris, yes, shows that you have more sensory neurons in your hands, feet, lips and tongue than you do in the rest of your body. And because there are more sensory neurons in these places, it makes them much more sensitive. Think about how it feels to have a piece of fluff in your mouth. It's intolerable. <laughs> but if you have a piece of fluff in your belly button, you probably don't even notice. <laughs> to prove which parts of the body have the most sensory neurons, here's an experiment you can try at home. You just need another human and a blindfold. Right, Chris, put this on and lie face down on the bench. Now, I need Chris to be blindfolded while I prod him with my fingers. Prod me? I said lie down. I'm going to prod him and then I'm going to ask him how many fingers I'm using. And I'm going to start with his hand. OK, Chris, are you ready? Yes. Chris, tell me how many fingers I'm touching your hand with. Two. Four. One. Well done, but I expected Chris to get all that right because his hands are loaded with sensory neurons and the bit of his brain that gets information from his hand is very large. So your hands are very accurate at detecting what they're touching. But now we're going to move to his back. One. Maybe two. One. That was much less successful, Chris. That's because you have far fewer sensory neurons there, which makes sense if you think about it. You don't need your back to be as sensitive as your hands. That's very true. And your sensory neurons aren't just for testing how many fingers are prodding your back. Your millions of sensory neurons get loads of information about the world around you, telling you if things are sharp, soft, hot or cold. But how do they do it? Well, we're going to show you by heading to... The beach! To show you how your sensory neurons detect the difference between hot and cold, Zan and I are going for a swim. Now, because the sea is cold, I've decided to pre-acclimatise, and I'm already pretty cold myself. Zan, on the other hand, has taken a different strategy. Zan? Now, my strategy is to get as warm as possible before I get in the freezing ocean. Come on, you've had enough time in there. Let's get going. Five more minutes, Chris. There's still a little warmth left in the hottie. Quite enough time. You've been in there an hour and a half. Give me that. Come on. It's freezing out here. OK, are you ready, Zahn? I'm boiling. I can't wait to get in. All right, last one ends a rotten egg. Three, two, one. Ow! Ooh. Ow! Ooh. Ow! Ah! This is embarrassing. Oh, lovely. <laughs> It's absolutely tropical. Why is your bit of ocean warmer than my bit of ocean? Have you heat there? No, don't be absurd. Sensory neurons work by detecting the difference in temperature between the water and your skin. There's hardly any difference between my cold skin and the cold water, so I feel fine. But for Zahn, there's a big difference between his warm skin and the cold water, so he feels extremely chilly. Once his skin temperature drops, he'll start to feel OK too. I must say now, it's absolutely lovely. Ouch. Did you know your skull is actually made up of 22 separate bones? That's amazing. Ouch. 
we're looking inside your head. Your brain controls pretty much everything going on in your body, so damaging it can be serious. Now, unluckily, it's very fragile, but luckily, our brains have some super protection. That's right, Chris. I am Maximus Brainius Protectoris, leader of the Ninth Legion, conqueror of Rome, protector of brains. Zand, I was thinking more along the lines of this. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Took me ages to get all this on. Now, this is a real human skull. Your brain is so important that your skull has a special safety system installed in it. That's right, brain gladiators. No, Zand, it is a clear, colourless liquid called cerebrospinal fluid. It acts as a cushion to protect your brain. And there's not much of it, about the same amount as the water in this jar. And to show you how it works, we're going to need to break some eggs. Imagine this jar is your skull. And I'm putting these eggs in to represent your delicate brain. What would happen to the brain in this skull without any cerebrospinal fluid? Zand, shake the skull. <laughs> well, as you can see, your brain would be seriously damaged. But what happens if the jar is full of water, just like the cerebrospinal fluid inside your skull? <laughs> The eggs remain intact, and so does your brain, because the cerebrospinal fluid fills the gaps between it and your skull. <sighs> you can see defeat, Zand. The cerebrospinal fluid has vanquished me. And as well as cerebrospinal fluid, your brain has another amazing piece of super protection. We're talking about the cranium, the dome of the skull that protects the brain. And we're going to show you how. I think it's time I retired from being a gladiator. Yes, Zand, white coat's on. As you can see here, the average thickness of this part containing the brain is only about half a centimetre. And it has to be that thin because it has to be light. Having a heavy head would be really difficult. I mean, imagine if your head was as heavy as, say, a, a watermelon. watermelon. <whistles> uh, well, what is it like having a watermelon on your head? It's very, very heavy. I mean, I'm getting a really sore neck. So that is why your skull needs to be thin. And yet, despite being so thin, it is incredibly strong, as we're about to show you. Zand, will you go and get some skulls, please? To the cupboard of everything! Look, I've found a skull here, Chris, but it's got lots of different lids, and some of them are pretty weird. Yep. I want to show you why our skull's shape gives it strength. And to do that, we need to compare it to some other shaped skulls. We've got a model skull with a traditional top, one that's flat, and one that's spiky. And to see which skull is the strongest, we need some kind of smashing device. Oh, well, we could always use my drop rig. It's right there. I call him Smashy. Nice one, Zand. That looks perfect. We're going to drop a set weight onto the top of each skull, starting from a height of 15 centimetres, to see if it smashes. Let's see which shape fares best. Ready, Zond? Release the smasher. Smashy! <laughs> if you'd gone to all the trouble to grow spikes on your head, you'd be pretty disappointed with that result. Flathead, it's your turn. Zond, release the smasher. It's called Smashy. Right. Well, that was disappointing. We need more force. Let's double the smashy height, Chris. Ah! <laughs> well, we got flat head that time. Now let's try the traditional design. Traditional for a reason, Zand. Here we go. Three, two, one. Seems to be OK so far. Let's raise the bar. This is where flat head smashed. This might hurt. Wow! We're now at 40 centimetres. We've pushed this further than ever before. Release Smashy! The human skull is hardcore! Surely it has to give at some point. Ready? Ready. Three, two, one. Oh, oh dear! <laughs> so, we've shown you that your extremely important, very special brain is protected in not one, but two ways. Firstly, by a layer of cerebrospinal fluid providing a safety cushion. And secondly, by your skull. Despite being only 6.5 millimetres thick, your skull is the perfect brain protector, thanks to its shape. Ouch. Did you know your eyes are made up of over 4 million working parts? 
Wow! Ouch! Zand, what are you doing? Oh, Chris, I'm blinking. Did you know that you blink 15 times every minute? And so if you take sleep time into account, that's 16 hours of waking time, and that means that we blink... 14,400 blinks every day. And if each blink lasts about a third of a second, that means I have my eyes closed for an hour and 20 minutes every day. Right. And your point is? Well, I thought if I could get all my blinking out of the way early in the morning, then I wouldn't miss anything later on. Well, Zander, it's an interesting idea, but it's never going to work because blinking is controlled by a reflex. <laughs> oh, Chris, I really thought I was on to something there. Wait, Zand, you are. You are a genius. Oh, am I? Yes. You cried and your eyes produced tears, which is exactly what today's lab is all about. Tears are a bit like the saliva in your mouth. They have loads of jobs. Lubrication, cleaning, fighting infection, gas exchange, delivering nutrients... Making your eyes sparkle? That's not an important one. What well, is to me. But to show you where they come from, we need to take a closer look at the human eye. Absolutely, Zand, which is why I need you to come and sit over here. I'm going to use this slit lamp to get a super detailed view. Lights down. And now we can see on the screen Zand's eye. Tears are produced in the lacrimal gland beneath your top eyelid. It's like a slow, dripping tap that constantly releases tears onto the outer surface of the eyeball. Whenever you blink, they spread across the surface of the eye. And I can show you where they end up. Because obviously, tears don't flow down your cheek all day. In the corner of your eye, you can see that little hole is called the puncta lacrimalis. And so tears flow across your eye, into that hole, and into your nose, a bit like the plug hole in a bath. And that's why your nose runs when you cry. Now, the tears that Zahn's making at the moment are called basal tears, and they protect the eye. They contain antibodies and they lubricate it. And when they run into the nose, you swallow them and recycle them. But not all tears are created equal, and we are going to try and prove it. Are we? How? By turning your tears, Zahn, into crystals. Crystals? In my eye? That's gonna hurt. No, Zand, not in your eyes, in our lab. Your eyes actually make different types of tears depending on why you cry. And I want to see if we can prove it. Are you ready, Zand? No! Good. Now, what we need you to do is to produce some tears. I will then collect them using a little syringe. So what kind of things make you cry? Well, I suppose a really sad movie. Brilliant. Sad tears. <laughs> <laughs> Success. Now, what about tears from chopping onions? And let's try some wind in your face while you're riding your bike kind of tears. Now, there's one more type of tears I had in mind. <coughs> tears of pain. <coughs> so I'm getting Zahn's eyebrows threaded. <coughs> Hold on, stop, stop. I can see a tear. Great. Now all we have to do is wait for the tears to dry and turn into crystals. Right, come on, Zahn, time to look at the results. First up, it's the onion tears. So these are your dried tears from when you chopped onions. Wow! Crystals from my eyes. These are actually reflex tears, and they're full of antibodies and enzymes, which is what you can see here as having dried on the dish. And those are produced to soothe the eyes when they're exposed to an irritant. That's why your eyes cry when you chop onions. Next up, it's the wind tears. Wow, that looks very different to the onion tears. Now, these are also reflex tears, but they look different because the body has responded to the wind differently to the onions by making a different combination of salts, antibodies and enzymes in response to a different irritant. What about my sad tears? Wow, so they look different again. They've got very beautiful crystals. Amazing. Now, these are emotional tears. They're a different kind of tear. They're produced in response to stress, and they contain a high level of a natural painkiller called leucine encephalin. Now time for the final tears, Zahn's pain tears. And look at that. These are also emotional tears, but they look different again because they also have a different combination of salts, enzymes, and antibodies in them. So in these 
four samples. We've got two different kinds of tears, reflex tears and emotional tears, but all of them actually look different, which just goes to show how incredibly fine-tuned your tears really are. <laughs> Did you know that your body produces about a litre of spit every day? Wow, that's amazing and a bit gross. Ouch. We're going to show you why you need spit, or saliva as we doctors say. Spit, dribble, slobber, whatever you call it, saliva really is wonderful stuff and important for keeping our mouths healthy and clean. But where does it come from? Well, to help us discover that, we need the help of a gleeker. A what? A gleeker? You know what a gleeker is? Well, yes, I do know what a gleeker is. I mean, of course I know what a gleeker is. I just don't think we have one. You know, in the cupboard of everything. That isn't a problem, Zand. Leave it to me. Attention, everyone. This is Dr Chris. Would any gleekers in the hospital please make their way to the secret lab immediately? That is all. Now we just need to wait. Come in. Hi, Chris. Hi, Jack. I heard you needed a gleeker. In that case, you can do that thing that gleekers do. I think it would just be easier if I show you that. Great. Gleek away. Zond! Wait, you're going to need these. What? What for? For the gleeking. Oh, for the gleeking, yes, of course. Of course I need these for the, uh, the gleeking. Stand back. Gleek away. Wow! That's amazing! I think we need to see that one more time in slow motion. Jack is doing this in the name of science, but remember, we're in the don't try this at home lab. Got it? When Jack gleeks, he's squirting saliva from his submandibular salivary gland out through a duct under his tongue called the Wharton duct. And that's it right there. So you have two other sets of saliva glands. Your parotids, which sit here and release saliva into your cheeks, and your sublingual glands, which release saliva under your tongue. Well, thank you, Jack, to you and your amazing saliva glands. You're very welcome, man. Which is the quickest way out of here? Oh, the quickest way is uh, that door on the right. OK. Now we've got a gleeker in the cupboard of everything. Whether you can gleek or not, you do have the same salivary glands as Jack. But why do you need saliva? As well as keeping your mouth fresh and healthy, saliva has another very important job. It helps you eat and swallow. It's 99% water, but there's a magic 1% containing mucus, which is what makes saliva slippery and slimy and helps you swallow. Now, if you want to know what this 1% magic mix does to the water in your saliva, well, this is something you can try at home. Wash your hands and then take a pinch of saliva between your thumb and forefinger, like this. And then if you lift your thumb and finger apart very slowly, what you can see is a strand of mucus with little beads on it. Now, that is made by long protein molecules. And that's what makes the water thick and helps it act as a lubricant for food. So to show you how amazing your mucusy saliva is, I bring you the Spit Slide Challenge. <laughs> is that Zond and I have a bowl each with some teeth to chew up this plate of food. We're going to chew up the food, put it in our mouths and send it down the tube that goes from our mouths to our stomachs. There is only one twist, and that is only one of us will have a bottle of saliva. And that one is me. Me. It's me. me. It's me. No, me. It's I'm going to have it. Sweet. Well, that bloke looks just like you, does he? So he does. Let the chewing begin. What? Come this on. isn't fair. Get on with it. Zahn's adding some saliva to his bowl of chewed food. Exactly what happens in your mouth. But I don't have any for mine. Without saliva, chewing up my food is immensely difficult. It's just formed a big, solid mass in my mouth. Thanks to saliva, my bowl of food is turning into a nice, slimy paste. Time to get it down the hatch. Here you go. Oh, yes! Look at how my food, mixed with saliva, slides down easily. But check out Chris's. Without saliva, my food gets stuck in the throat instead of sliding to the stomach. Chris, you've got to stop. He's choking. He didn't even get to eat his tomatoes yet. Well, you know what this means. What? 
Chris is in danger? No, but I'm the winner of the Spitside Challenge, thanks to saliva. Thanks, saliva. Did you know that in your lifetime, your mouth will produce enough saliva to fill two swimming pools? Wow! Did you know you're more likely to chew your food on the right side of your mouth if you're right-handed? And on the left side if you're left-handed. What side do you like to chew your food on? Today we're finding out about a surprisingly strong muscle in your body. Oh, 502. Well, wow, son, 502, that is really impressive. Well, I've got to keep my muscles big and strong. That is a good idea. Here, let me have a go. No! Oh! Sand. Do you know what the strongest muscle in your body is? Well, we're going to show you. Now, what we're going to need for this, Sand, is someone really, really strong. Have you got anyone in the cupboard? Hmm. Let me think. Oh, I've got the perfect person. Tiny! <laughs> sideways, Tiny. I've told you, sideways. All right, Doc. Oh, hi, Tiny. Now, you might remember Tiny from Series 1. He lifted me above his head. Meet Tiny from Tottenham. Yeah, we've already met. Now, as you can see, Tiny has lots of big muscles all over his body. But which of his muscles do you think is the strongest? The bicep? It's a good guess, Sand. They're some of the biggest biceps in Britain, but they're not the strongest muscles in his body. How about the gluteus maximus? That is strong, but for its size, it's actually his jaw muscle, or to use its proper name, the masseter. Your jaw has four main muscles that help it move up and down. All four work together to move the jaw down, but it's just the mighty masseter that pulls it back up. It allows your jaw to exert enough power to chew through super tough foods, and so for its small size, it's the strongest muscle in your body. Now, you can feel your masseter at home if you touch the side of your face here like this and slowly clench and open your teeth. <coughs> you should feel it popping out the side of your jaw. Can you feel it, Zond? Tiny? What are you up to? <coughs> I'm almost there. <coughs> Oh. Well, that was closer than it looked. We'll have a rematch soon, Tiny. Thanks for coming in. Well, I'll be off home then. All right. Thanks, Tiny. So, now we know what the strongest muscle is, but why don't we put it to the test to find out just how powerful it really is? And for this, I need... Oh. The Bite Force Meter! <gasps> its job is to measure the power of force applied to it, so we can test the strength of my jaw. Zond, how strong do you think your jaw is? Strong. Not as strong as my hands, but still strong. OK, Zond, well, let's put that to the test. It's time for Battle of the Bite Force. <laughs> now, Zond, squeeze that as hard as you can between your hands. Squeeze! The force is being measured in pressure, equivalent to kilograms applied to the sensor. 3.8, 4.2, 4.7. <sighs> Must be some kind of world record, I would think. Well, let's see. Now I'm going to put it in my mouth and you can read off the number. Don't you try this dangerous scientific experiment. We can because we're doctors. Bite! 28, 30.5. That is amazing. Oh, wow. Chris's jaw is six times stronger than my entire upper body. And in fact, Zand, my jaw's even stronger than that. If my teeth were made of steel and wouldn't break, I could squeeze up to 55 kilos. To demonstrate how strong your jaw is, we're going to show you what its strength could do to everyday objects. So we're going to need these. A can of pop, a glass and a mobile phone. Ooh, that looks just like my mobile phone. And we can't test the strength of our jaws using our teeth, so for this, we're going to need a special machine. This is a hydraulic industrial crushing machine. We're going to use it to crush things with a force of 55 kilos, the strength of a human jaw. So let's start with Zahn's, I mean, a mobile phone. I'm pumping the machine up to 55 kilograms of pressure. It's not looking good for that phone. Two metal prongs are crushing the mobile phone. There you go, a phone crushed with 55 kilos. Now for a can of fizzy pop. It's squeezing. The pressure's rising. Come on, Bitey, you can do it. <laughs> and that's why I never bite my fizzy drinks. That was amazing. So we've seen what our jaw strength can do to a mobile phone and a metal can. Now let's try a glass. Here we go. 
Chris gets the machine up to 55 kilograms of pressure again. Oh! There we go. A force of 55 kilos applied to a glass. Did you know no two people have identical sets of teeth? Your teeth are as unique as your fingerprint, so be proud of your gnashers. Ah, oh, Chris, you're just in time. It's 2.30, so... You know what happens at 2.30. Uh, is it time for your nap? No! At 2.30... 2.30... We go to the dentist! 2.30. Anyway, come on, we've got to get an X-ray of your teeth. Fine, OK. To the cupboard of everything. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ellie. Wow, Hi. there really is everything in your cupboards, aren't X-ray complete. <laughs> now, this is called an orthopantomogram. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, it, no, it's not that kind of panto, Zand. The panto mm -hmm. stands for the technique used, panoramic tomography. Now, the amazing thing about this is that you can see the whole tooth. If you look in your mouth, you can actually only see the top third. That's the crown, the white bit. But on the X-ray, we can see what's below the gum. Your teeth have roots, and they're twice as long as the crown. Now, that X-ray is really cool, Chris, but there's a lot more going on inside your tooth, and I'm going to show you using this huge model. But, Zon, we don't need a huge model, because today we've got the real thing. This is a tooth that's been given to us by a dentist that's been cut in half. What? You cut the dentist in half? No, Zon, the tooth has been cut in half. The dentist is absolutely fine. For you. Now, your teeth are made of amazing stuff. The glossy white surface layer is called enamel. It protects the whole tooth, and it's the hardest substance in your entire body. But it can be worn away by acidic drinks and sugary food, and it won't grow back once it's gone, so look after it. Now, underneath is the layer called the dentin, and underneath the dentin is the pulp. And they're sensitive layers of living tissue, and they support the enamel. They both contain nerves, which means that problems in your teeth can be painful. But have you ever noticed that your teeth are different shapes? Why is that? Well, we're going to show you. Only an edible experiment can answer that question. Ta -da! Why are you wearing that? We need to have a good close-up look. What Zahn's trying to say is that he's ready for the experiment and he wants to have a good close-up look at the different shapes of teeth, so he's using a mouth stretcher. That's what I said! So let's have a look at the four different types of teeth in Zahn's mouth, because they all do different jobs. At the front, we have incisors. Four at the top and four at the bottom. Just behind the incisors, there are canines. And then just behind the canines, there are the premolars. And just behind the premolars are the molars. But why do we need these four different types of teeth? Well, we're going to find out in... A terrific tooth testing test! We're going to see what happens when we bite and chew different foods using our teeth, but not our normal teeth of different shapes. We're going to be using... These! <laughs> we both have a custom-made set of gnashers, but they're made up of only one type of tooth. Zand has a full set of molars... So he's Team Mola. Chris has a mouthful of canines. So he's Team Canine. Our challenge is to bite into a range of food and chew it. Reveal the food. Then, rather than swallowing the food, we'll spit it out and see which type of tooth has worked best. First up, a sandwich. Hmm. With soft food, Team Mola chews brilliantly. Whereas Team Canine can bite, but definitely can't chew. What you can see there is a perfect bite of sandwich, completely unchewed. What about eating a hard apple? I can't get any. I can't get any apple. Team Mola is really bad at biting. And Team Canine has a good bite, but can't chew it. You should give it to me and I can chew it up for you. What, and then give it back to me and I could swallow it? No, that's disgusting. And it's the same story with a steak. I can tear it off easily, but then I can't chew it. Watch. Well, I can chew it, but I can't actually get a piece off. Hmm, you're just pulverising it. So, who won that one then, Chris? Well, I don't think either of us did very well, did we? What a disaster. 
it proved exactly what we wanted, Zand. Only having one shape of tooth makes eating impossible. You need your sharp, pointy canines at the front for biting, and then your flat, wide molars at the back for mashing food up. Did you know a sneeze is faster than a cheetah? It can travel up to 100 miles an hour. Wow! Bless you! Now, did you know that you have between 20 and 40 billion white blood cells in your body? They are like an army of germ-fighting warriors waiting to attack invaders like viruses and bacteria. Did you know babies are born without proper kneecaps? The hard bone on your knees grows as you get older. Cool. Ouch. Did you know that if a baby continued to grow at the rate they do in the first year of their life, by the time they reached adulthood, they'd be over nine metres tall? That's twice the height of a double-decker bus. Wow! <laughs> Did you know that when your hair gets wet, the water temporarily breaks some of the bonds between the protein molecules in each strand? This means wet hair can stretch up to 30% more than normal. Wow! Ouch. Did you know your heart beats over 100,000 times a day? That's about 42 million times a year. Wow! Ouch. 